one verse. So, yes, uh, it's very slow. Yeah, I can imagine you're going to be all your lifetime before you get through the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, we, we've been here for about three or more years, and we, this is where we are at because yeah. we slowly. Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> if many will pass away during during the course of the program. Many will pass away before, if even we can get to the tent. <laughs> yeah. Of the twelfth, we'll have to come up again and finish it off. <laughs> yeah, I understand it takes about fifty or so years if you have to take it, and we don't even do it every day. We only do it uh for the five working days in the week. Two days a week. Uh Monday through Friday. Five days a week. Yes, Maraj. Doing okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, we usually go live on YouTube, which we are live now. So, uh, Maharaj, we're going to play the Jai Radha Madhava of Sri Prabhupada, and then uh, we may begin. Sure. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Maybe we're not hearing it. We're not hearing it. It's all
राधा कृष्ण वो गोपना शाम कंद राधा कुंद वृंदावन धाम की जाए नवदीप धाम की जाए गंगा माई की जाए जमुना माई की जाए द्वारका धाम की जाए स्वामी तो भक्तवृंद की जाए Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to Krishna. All glories to Guru Dev. All glories to His Holiness, Janandan Goswami Maharaj. And all glories to assembled Vaishnava Vaishnava devotees. Those who have gathered here and those who may be watching or listening to us via YouTube. And whoever may be watching this uh, clip later on. Um, today we are very much blessed. We have His Holiness Gananda Goswami Maharaj, who will be speaking to us from the Nectarian Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe today is the first day Maharaj is speaking on this platform. And uh, we do not have many devotees assembled at the moment. Uh, but at the end of the Katha, by which time many devotees would have been here, we're going to give a little bit more introduction about His Holiness, uh, so devotees may get to know Maharaj a little bit more. So Maharaj, we thank you for being here. And uh, uh, like I was trying to explain earlier, that uh, the, the speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam on this platform is just like the temple room setting. So we'll put the verse on the screen and you speak. Devotees may not, may not respond uh, back when you recite or chant the slokas because it creates distortion. And then you speak. And we are very grateful to have your association and blessings. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, so we're going to put the verse on the screen. Let me see. And you want me to chant the verse? Yes, Maharaj. Just one through or? Um... Uh, whichever way you decide to take it. Um, some some uh, just do it once, some do it thrice, and then do the synonyms, translation prepared. Some just do the uh, chanting of the slokas and then go straight to the translation and then to the perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, today is very special because we have your presence here and it's also the last verse of the ninth chapter of the mm -hmm. uh, Canto 2, Shema mm Bhagavatam. -hmm. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Interesting. Yes. Hey, Krishna. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 9, Text Number 46. Yadutaham Tvaya Prishto Vairajat Purusharitam Yatasita Dupakyaste Prashnanam Yang Shta Krishna Shaha You can repeat but don't put your uh, sound on. Yadutaham Tvaya Prishto Vairajat Purusharidam Yatasitta de Pakyaste Prashnan Anyangsh to Kritsna Shaha. So I go on if that's okay, Sahadev is okay? Yes, Maharaj, please. Okay. 
And because we're obviously it's not the same online as it is when we're sitting in a class room and the repetition is not the same. So I, I will just go on to the verse with your permission. Is that okay? Yes, my right, please. Yes. Just have to readjust the screen. I can't see the verse right now. Um, I've got it. I've got it. It's just that the pictures were blocking the screen. Oh. Hare Krishna. So this verse is, as you said, it's the last verse of this ch chapter of the Bhagavatam. And spoken by Shukadeva Goswami. Um, and he's recognizing the much of the chapter, previous chapter, we could say, were questions of Pariksit Maharaj to the to the uh, great sage Shukadeva. Now, just before we start, uh, most likely the, the devotees online, are they actually in Africa? Some are in Africa, some are from different parts of the world. Some are from UK, some usually from the US, mm -hmm. some from Africa, sometimes from South America. You have African descent or mixed? African descent and both mixed as well. All varieties of devotees. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Well. Thank you. So, Shukadeva Goswami, speaking. O King, your questions as to how the universe became manifested from the gigantic form of the personality of Godhead, as well as other questions, I shall answer in detail by explanation of the four verses already mentioned. Report by Srila Prabhupada. As stated in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, this great transcendental literature is the ripened fruit of the tree of Vedic knowledge. And therefore, all questions that can be humanly possible regarding the universal affairs, beginning from its creation, are all answered in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The answers depend only on the qualification of the person who explains them. Ten divisions of Srimad Bhagavatam as explained by the great speaker Srila Shukdev Goswami are the limitation of all questions. And intelligent persons will derive all intellectual benefits from them by proper utilization. And that's the end of the Bhaktivedanta purports of the second canto, ninth chapter. Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Answers by citing the Lord's version. Hare Krishna. Om Jnana Timrandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Yena Tasme Shri Gurave Namaha. Hare Krishna. This is a very amazing chapter where the four, generally we understand the four seed verses of Srimad Bhagavatam are contained and originally imparted to Lord Brahma. Lord Krishna explains how he is to be understood, how he is to be realized. But today in the purport, Sri Prabhupada is particularly uh, mentioning the eligibility of the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam as the, the key. We can look at one or two of the points Prabhupada mentions today. Um, uh, this great Srimad Bhagavatam, Nikma Kapat Tarogali Tam Palam, as we see in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it's the ripened fruit, the fruit 
goes through different stages, as we know. But the ripened fruit is the actual objective of the tree, of the cultivation, etc. Srimad Bhagavatam is that ripened fruit. The real taste, which we're all searching after. The ripened fruit or the essence of all the Vedic literatures is the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada mentions that first off. And then one of the other aspects of Srimad Bhagavatam is that ultimately all questions are answered in Srimad Bhagavatam. Obviously, we're not looking at, let's say, phenomenal information only, although in this particular chapter and preceding chapters in the next chapter, second canto, third canto, tremendous amount of information is shared about, you could say, the, what we see, the phenomenal creation in front of our eyes, the material world, how it comes to be, what it's comprised of, what its purposes are, as this verse also infers, um, re requesting how this is possible, that um, how the universe became manifested. All this is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam, in the second and third cantos particularly. All these questions and answers which we find in Srimad Bhagavatam, practically from the very beginning, Srimad Bhagavatam is questions and answers, practically. Within Parikshit Maharaj may ask questions and then Shukadeva will answer. First of all, it's the sages of Naima Shrang and we're asking questions of Sutta. So we'll go Swami, who then describes the incidents which he heard um, between Shukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. And then there are dis discussions, questions and answers with Vidura and Maitreya and so many others we find in the Srimad Bhagavatam with Narada Muni and so many others, is questions and answers throughout the whole Bhagavatam. Even Bhagavad Gita is based upon the questions and answers. Arjuna is questioning, Krishna is answering. This is the process of entering into Krishna consciousness, of clearing up. Uh, realization, another, you could say, point is mentioned, not many really mentioned here particularly, but is an understood that our real, the realization of Krishna consciousness is only possible when the darkness in our heart or the clouds in our heart, the doubts in our heart are removed, as Krishna says, by the torchlight of knowledge. So in the beginning, we have so many doubts related to the phenomenal world, maybe not so much with the transcendent or the noumenal world, but with the phenomenal world, we have so many doubts in relationship with Krishna consciousness, due to our time as sojourn within this material, we have developed so many concepts and so many attachments and so many misconceptions and so on. They have to be cleared up. The Srimad Bhagavatam doesn't just jump into transcendental subject matters into themselves, but it also deals with a relationship the relationship with the material world, with the transcendence, the relationship with the material world, with the supreme, what is the connection therein? This knowledge is essential to remove the doubts which are keeping us anchored in this material world. It's a form of sambandha jnana, or basic knowledge, on which we build faith to practically apply the process of devotional service. In the process of, of, of spiritual life, of advancement in Krishna consciousness, no doubt there are many different stages, right from the very basic stage where people are following, in human life at least, some basic religious principles given by God. Um, and if we follow those, then gradually, by the grace of the Lord, our consciousness becomes slowly cleansed. And gradually, step by step, we start to progress towards spiritual life, towards um, Krishna consciousness. So questions and answers are asked. And we're, today we'll look a little bit more focus, I think, on questions and answers rather than on the philosophical aspect which is discussed in this section of the Bhagavatam. In the next chapter, um, answers, Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. 
all questions can be answered through Srimad Bhagavatam. Right away, Chukadeva Goswami describes these um, 10 aspects of Srimad Bhagavatam, 10 subject matters, as we have in the Bhagavad Gita, five subject matters are generally given. And Bhagavatam 10, and they are often aligned with the various 10 cantos of the Bhagavatam, the first 10. Sometimes Krishna Shakavati describes that they are found throughout all 10, all 12 cantos. But whatever it is, they're the subject matter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And they cover all aspects of the relative connection. Actually, in one sense, everything we can see is spiritual. But to transform, understand the phenomenal world in relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the process of transformation. It's the process of becoming Krishna conscious. So that's explained to remove all doubts in throughout all the Vedic literatures and in the Srimad Bhagavatam also, to clear up the doubts regarding, you could say, our particular philosophies or our attachments in this world and how everything is emanating from the Lord. From the body of God, Vadakshai Vishnu, all the various creations within the framework of a particular Brahmanda or universe are, are evolving through the media of Lord Brahma, but actually through Garbhadakshay Vishnu, the great universal form of the Lord. In one sense. And how Lord Vishnu himself creates the entire material universe, is all this is explained in these cantos, and how he is beyond the uh, material energy, even though he appears to be within it, is beyond it, and so on. Everything is explained there. These ten divisions of Shema Bhagavatam explained. You can, in fact, in the very next verse, so we'll leave that for your next class, of course, they are explained. Prabhupada also says in the purport how um, all there's not a question which can't be answered by really understanding Shema Bhagavatam. Of course, it doesn't mean silly little questions like how to change the time on my watch. You don't need to change the time on your watch if you're on the platform of transcendence. There is no time. Time is, time is uh, uh, what they say, is um, by its absence, conspicuous by its absence. There's eternal time. There is no limit to time, although we are basically controlled by time in this world. When one understands the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, all purposes are served, as we see in Bhagavad Gita. It starts right in the beginning of Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita. In the second chapter, Krishna says to Arjuna, Yavan, Arta, Utapani, Sabhatak, Samplatodake, that all purposes that are served by the small pond or body of water are automatically served by the great res reservoir, great ocean. Similarly, one who knows the purpose behind the Vedas, all the purposes of the Vedas are known. Krishna also says in the Bhagavad Gita, maybe in the 15th chapter, one knows me without doubt as the Supreme Personality of God, it is understood to be the knower of everything. How does that work? It doesn't sound like it. People, concept of knowledge in this world, of course, is relative. But even still, whatever a devotee needs to know, because Krishna is the source of knowledge, he gives that within the heart. Sarvasya chaham vridhisani vishto. Matakshmati jnanam poanam cha. We just have to connect with Krishna. Right? And we connect with Krishna in, in terms of this subject matter to attentively hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. If we hear the Bhagavatam with attentiveness, everything will be revealed. It's explained in many places in the Bhagavatam how when we hear with rapt attention, when we'll see Krishna on the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, an amazing meditation of Krishna. It's not that we have to concoct it, it's just that Krishna will reveal himself. He reveals himself to those who are pure in heart. It's not a question of knowing. It's not a question of imposition. It's a question of Krishna. He reveals. Everything is revealed knowledge from within our hearts. Krishna reveals it. And to the degree that we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, the holy name of Krishna, and all the various, you could say, aspects of our endeavors and devotional service, the more we're attentive, the more Krishna will be attentive to us. 
the more we reveal ourselves to Krishna, the more he reveals us himself to us. Elsewhere in this particular purpose, all questions, we cannot imagine. Nothing exists outside the absolute truth. So how can a question, it may be perverted by our coverings of the modes of nature, but ultimately everything emanates, stems from the Supreme Personality of God. Even the questions which we ask, in one sense, we could say are inspired by the Supreme Lord. He gives the faith even to the conditioned souls and the inspiration to ask various questions about mundane subjects which they're attached to. And for a devotee, if we're sincere, also to ask relevant questions. Another important point in this purport, we have promised that all intelligent persons will derive all intellectual benefits from them. That means hearing the Nearest topics of Srimad Bhagavatam. If we know how to utilize them properly, how to utilize this knowledge properly, not prematurely, but how to apply it, Prabhupada straight states several times, even in the purpose of the Bhagavatam, how we should hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Is you could take two aspects there. One is the quality of our hearing, assuming that the speaker is qualified, and two the way that we hear in terms of proper says we should hear it step by step by step, not jumping over to the tenth canto. However, in other places, Prabhupada says, because of his purpose primarily, you can hear from anywhere in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is nectar. And that's a fact. But normally we hear in step in step by step by step. It's a progression, Prichit Maj, by his questions. And consequently, to anyone else who's asking questions in the conversation of Bhagavatam is taking us from one step, one ladder to the next, and I pass to the tenth canto. So we're going to go back a little bit. And there's one of those central features here. The answers depend on the qualification of the person who explains them. They also, you could say, depend on the person who's asking them. We um, we may hopefully have understood by, by hearing from Shastra and so many other methods some idea of the qualification of the person who's speaking. Um, but let's look at our own qualification also. Um, if we really want to understand Srimad Bhagavatam and the essential truth there. So I'm going to go right to the first canto here. Um, and if you have a, a method of following, you can follow. This is going back to the first canto. And if you see in the very first canto, the very first chapter is called Questions by the Sages. The sages want to know many things. Here we go. Well, it's great you've opened it. We're not going to go through it, by, by the way, first for first. But anyway, the idea you get. This chapter is primarily, um, of course, the glorification of the Srimad Bhagavatam and also the glorification or acceptance of Sutta Goswami as a suitable person to speak to the sages who are very concerned. Most people's questions are related to their own interest, to their own needs, to their own desires and so on. Um, but these questions are for the sake of the welfare of all citizens, of all living entities. The sages are approaching Sutta Goswami, asking him relevant questions for the welfare of all. So after their questions have been asked, they ask six primary questions. We don't have time to go through those. You can read for yourself in chapter one. But at the very beginning of chapter two, in text number five, uh, Sutta Goswami replies to the um, sages of Naimisharanya. Chapter two, you were very good there, very fast off the mark. Their divinity and divine service were excellent. So in text number five, there's, these verses are probably amongst the most famous verses in Srimad Bhagavatam. Munayo saro prishtoham Yet Krita Krishna Samprashne in Atma Supersidati. Right from the very beginning, Sutta Goswami um, gives very great key in this verse. O sages, he says, I've been justly questioned by you. 
your questions are worthy, worthy, because they relate to Lord Krishna. So questions should be related to Lord Krishna. That means how we can relate to Lord Krishna as well. And so are of relevance to the world's welfare. Only questions of this sort are capable of completely satisfying the self. Everyone's looking for satisfaction, but in this world, no one is finding satisfaction. Just some temporary relief. Most of our questions are how to get relief from the distressful condition which we're exposed to. How to get freedom from health issues, and economic issues, mental issues, physical issues, e social issues, family issues, political issues, so many doubts and fears, and so on and so forth. So many questions. How to get money so we can live a life. Questions, how to get a job. They all, you know, you could say necessary in one sense, but they're superfluous to the soul. Anato Pashamam Shrikshat Bhakti Yoga Hokshi Jai. Uh, all the miseries of this world, which are totally superfluous to the soul, can mit be mitigated immediately by the linking process of devotional service. But people in general don't know this. Therefore, this uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Vyasadeva's Kampada, Srimad Bhagavatam for the welfare of everyone. Back to the fifth verse. We've gone off screen again now. But the first canto, chapter two, text five. The purport to that verse is very... Very relevant and very important to hear. Let's hear from Srila Prabhupada what he says. Since it has been stated here and before that in the Bhagavatam the absolute truth is to be known. You see that in the first verse of the Bhagavatam. The questions of the sages of Naimitranya are proper and just because they pertain to Krishna who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth. In Bhagavad Gita, the Personality of Godhead says that in all the Vedas, there is not, nothing but the urge for searching after Him, Lord Krishna. That's the purpose behind everything. Even in this world, indirectly, we're searching for, really, for Krishna. We just don't know it. We think we can find Krishna in sense gratification. But it's not. It's only a shadow of the real truth itself. In Bhagavad Gita, the personality, thus the questions that pertain to Krishna are the sum and substance of all Vedic inquiries. The whole world is full of questions and answers. Birds, the beasts, and the men are all busy in a matter of perpetual questions and answers. In the morning, the birds in the nest become busy with questions and answers. And in the evening, also the same birds come back and again become busy with questions and answers. We may not realize that the birds are not just singing to entertain us. There's some kind of communication going on there between them. We don't know what it is. But there's some kind of, who knows what they're talking or communicating with each other. The human being, unless he is fast asleep at night, is busy with questions and answers. I don't know if anyone knows that someone did a study of how many questions an average person asks in a day. It was a lot. I don't know exactly how many. I can't remember one time. I heard some figure. The businessmen in the market are busy with questions and answers, and so also the lawyers in the court and the students in the schools and colleges. Because we have a lot of questions in the mind which we don't um, verbally express. All the time, my mind is coming up with questions of various sorts, constantly trying to understand what's going on, what to do, why. The legislators in the parliament are also busy with questions and answers, and the politicians and the press representatives are all busy with questions and answers. Although they go on making such questions and answers for their whole lives, they are not at all satisfied Satisfaction of the soul can only be obtained by questions and answers on the subject of Krishna. Yenatma superseded. And then we'll jump over the next section, except for the last part, last half of that paragraph there. Because the Srimad Bhagavatam deals with questions and answers that are related to Krishna, 
we can derive the highest satisfaction only by reading and hearing this transcendental literature. I said, derive the highest satisfaction only by reading and hearing. And that's probably says to hear is more important than reading. It means to discuss within the assembly of devotees, questioning and answering, discussing, churning the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's another aspect which we'll go on to in a short while in relationship to that. But this churning the Srimad Bhagavatam is how, just like the milk ocean was churned by the demons and demigods, nectar eventually came out of the ocean. Dirt comes out too. When we churn the Bhagavatam, when we hear it, doubts will come and various attachments may also surface. But if we keep churning and uh, take shelter of the holy name, take shelter of Guru Garanga, then the dirty things will not cover it, but rather they'll be removed. They'll be Lord Shiva swallowed all the poison up. He swallowed it up from that great ocean. So in the fire of devotional service, they can also be burned up. And then the nectar will begin to uh, manifest as the churning of Srimad Bhagavatam. One should learn the Srimad Bhagavatam and make an all-around solution to all problems pertaining to social, political, or religious matters. Srimad Bhagavatam and Krishna are the sum total of all things. From the wonderful statements of Srila Prabhupada. Very simple. Our lives, unfortunately, we're so complex, we have so many other thoughts and desires, you could say, on our mind. But all problems are solved by associating with Srimad Bhagavatam. When we go to the second canto, there's a similar statement here in the second canto, chapter one. And this is spoken by Shukadeva Goswami. It's text number one of the second canto, chapter one. At the end of the first canto, um, there were some very relevant questions. And if we look at the end second, actually, sorry, Prabhu, we'll look at the end of the second canto, of the end of the first canto, rather, first. Because at the right at the end of the first canto, you could say the trigger, the catalyst for the speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam by Shukadeva Goswami was um, presented by King Parikshit. Here is the catalyst. It's on text number, I suppose, 37. Let me see. Maybe 36. I'm not sure. Um, let's go to 37. Shukadeva Goswami, by the way, has just appeared. In the first canto, Shukadeva Goswami is not present. There's a conversation between the sages and Sutta Goswami. But at the beginning of the, uh, at the end rather, of the 19th chapter, 19th chapter, text 37, herein we find the arrival of Sukadeva Goswami and the questions of Pariksha. And Pariksit says, you are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. I'm therefore begging you to show the way of perfection for all persons and especially for one who is about to die. And I guess we all know this is the question, the next question which he asks after that statement. Um, Prabhupada explains in the purport, very important point in the purport. Unless one is perfectly anxious to inquire about the way of perfection, so anxious, sometimes the word is used lowly or, or great greed, Intensive greed to know or to obtain, and is there. Um, there is no necessity of approaching a spiritual master. We should be anxious to hear, anxious for inquiry. Okay, that may take some time before that becomes, um, let's say, very intense. But the questions, a spiritual master is not a kind of decoration for a householder. Generally, a fashionable materialist engages a so-called spiritual master without any profit. And it goes on. Maharaj Parikshit um, is the right type of disciple because he puts forward questions vital to the interests of all men. He's asking questions for our welfare. He himself is, we may not have the intelligence or the purity to ask these questions. So it's very important to hear from these great souls, these pure devotees, 
the questions they ask and the answers which are given, it will clear up all of our doubts. That's why the Bhagavatam is full of questions and answers. It says, interest all men, particularly for the dying men. We're all dying men. And when the moment we're born, we're beginning to die. So we're all, in one sense, dying men or dying, dying women, whatever you want to call it, dying people. The question put forward by Maharaj Pariksit is the basic principle of the complete thesis of Srimad Bhagavatam. The basic principle of the complete thesis of Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything that comes after this is specifically related to this question of Parikshit Maharaj. So it's very important we have a scientific understanding, what we call science, of the phenomenal world, which means you know, a spiritual understanding of its creation and its purpose and maintenance and destruction and everything, so that we can become free of our entanglement in the material world. Now let us see how intelligently the great master replies. So we'll go on. Um, that was the question at the end of the first canto. Now we'll go to the second canto, chapter one, text number one. If we can have that on the screen, it would be nice for the verse to follow. So Shukadeva Goswami, just like Sutta Goswami, after the sages had asked their wonderful questions and uh, Sutta Goswami had answered them one by one by one. Um, and now we will see Sukadeva Goswami expanding on the initial question of Pariksha. The verse at the end of the ninth chapter, as we read today, um, was related to a series of questions by Pariksha Maharaj, detailed questions about the creation of the universe and its relationship with the Supreme Lord. But this uh, subject now is just a general answer by Sukadeva Goswami to the question of Pariksit Maharaj, what is our duty at the time of death? And Sukadeva Goswami says, my dear king, your question is glorious because it is very beneficial to all kinds of people. That's what makes it glorious. Devotional service is glorious because it's beneficial to all people. Baba gives examples like feeding the stomach or watering the root of a tree. When we ask questions pertaining to Krishna, pertaining to devotional service, they are beneficial to all living entities who happen to hear, the person who speaks, the person who hears, those who happen to be around, and anyone who hears thereafter and also benefits. They're all beneficial. They're not just related to one person's relative needs. Questions related or mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam, related to the topics of Srimad Bhagavatam, are beneficial for all living entities. And that therefore, he says here, they are glorious. And they're also pleasing to Krishna. Because it's very beneficial. The answer to this question what is our duty at the time of death, that is, is the prime subject matter for hearing. And it is approved by all transcendentalists. So that's, again, more or less similar to the answer given by Sutta Goswami in the first canto. Um, Prabhupada writes in the purports, even the question is so nice it is the best subject matter for hearing. Just the question alone is so nice. What to speak of the answer? The, the question is so, uh, you know, I, I don't know if people in general think like that at all. What do I do now? They may think, I try to avoid death. I try to enjoy as much as I can in the last moments of my life. Maybe pious people start to pray. and they, Generally, people have very little idea what they're supposed to do. And it's all very well thinking it at the time of death, but Bhagavatam explains also that it's not just at the time of death, but our life should be molded so at the time of death automatically we remember Krishna. Simply by such questioning and hearing one can achieve the highest perfectional stage of life because Lord Krishna is the original supreme person. Any question about him is original and perfect. 
another unique factor about spiritual life. You can hear this subject, even the subject matter mentioned in the second and third cantos about the creation, etc., the secondary creation, and what have you. Uh, but you can hear them again and again and again, and they are ever fresh. They never become dry because they're, they're related to the Supreme Personality of God. They're not just some scientific speculation. These are facts. These are words spoken by the Lord to Brahma and to our parampara. They're ever fresh. They're enlightening. They're beneficial. They're purifying. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said the highest perfection of life is to achieve the transcendental loving service of Krishna. Because questions and answers about Krishna elevate one to that transcendental position. The questions of Maharaj Pritchard about Krishna philosophy are greatly glorified. Maharaj Pritchard wanted to absorb his mind completely in Krishna. And such absorption can be effective simply by hearing about the uncommon activities of Krishna. Even the activities of Krishna in relation with the material world are glorious and are very uncommon. And very purifying to hear. We've got to have purified heart in order for the subject matter of Krishna consciousness to be understood or to enter into the, the, sub, the real subject of devotional service. The heart has to be purified. So this is the subject right here in the subject matter of, of the creation and so on of the universe is very purifying to the heart. For instance, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that simply by understanding the transcendental nature of Lord Krishna's appearance, disappearance, and activities, the Prabhupada writes disappearance, we don't usually hear that, one can immediately return home back to Godhead. In other words, even the Lord's disappearance is totally transcendental. His creation is transcendental. His impregnation of the living entity is transcendental. It's not a material act. Though it appears to be one. It may be seen from our point of view as a material situation. From, from the Lord's point of view, everything is spiritual. Back to Godhead. We never come back to this material condition of material existence. It is very auspicious to hear always about Krishna. So Maharaj Prichit requested Shukradeva Goswami to narrate the activities of Krishna so that he could engage his mind in Krishna. The activities of Krishna are non-different from Krishna himself. See how many times Krishna's name, somebody can count, how many times Krishna's name is mentioned in this purport? Quite a few times. As long as one is engaged in hearing such transcendental activities of Krishna, he remains aloof from the conditional life of material existence. The topics of Lord Krishna are so auspicious that they purify the speaker, the hearer, and the inquirer. They are compared to the Ganges water, which flows from the toe of Lord Krishna. Wherever the Ganges waters go, they purify the land uh, and the person who bathes in them. Similarly, Krishna Kata, or the topics of Krishna, are so pure that wherever they are spoken, the place to hear, the inquire, the speaker, and all concerned become purified. Such a nice purport. Huh? So the inquirer, the qualification of the inquirer, um, we, if we look in the first canto again, if we go to the probably text number 20, now let's see where that is. Um, first canto, yeah, it would be in the first canto. Chapter, um, where is that first canto gone? Here it is. Also, in the second chapter of the first canto, there's a very wonderful verse. It's text number 16, very famous verse, Shushu Shro. It's where Shushu Shro, one who was engaged in hearing, Shushu Shro, Shradhanasya, Vasudeva, Kitaruchi, Syan Mahatsevaya, Vipra. When you're tears in a shave and very famous verse. Um, in this series of verses, how we can become cleansed to the effects of the modes of nature, how we can develop attraction for hearing the message of Godhead. 
Oh, twice born sages, Sutta Goswami speaking, by serving those devotees who are completely free from all vice, great service is done. By such service, one gains affinity for hearing the messages of Vasudeva. So this word shushusho is a very similar verse as elsewhere. Although it says one who is engaged in hearing, it also uh, describes in other places the eligibility for hearing this message of Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, hearing about Krishna. There's an eligibility that we've already heard one of the eligibilities, one anxiousness or one's intense desire to hear that message. The sincerity of purpose we hear in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Pranipatina Pariprasnaya Sevya, Vidikshanti Tityanam Ganinastad Vidarshan. How one should approach a spiritual master, inquire from him submissively and render service. So there should be submissive inquiry as well as the surrendering or the rendering of service um, to the spiritual master. By rendering service, as we see in this verse, um, the heart becomes cleansed and one's inclination to hear about Krishna starts to awaken. This is by the grace of the Lord. When he sees a devotee is engaged in service, the Lord inspires the devotee within, cleanses the devotee's heart and gives that devotee the opportunity to hear about him. As you see in the next verse, um, Krishna, text 17, sorry, you're, you, it would be difficult to keep up. You are now in the Bhagavad Gita, very important verse. But we're going back to the 17th verse of the second chapter of the first canto, where Sutta Goswami says, Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma in everyone's heart, text number 17. And the benefactor of the truthful devotee cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous and properly heard and chanted. So in the beginning, this may seem like a little contradiction if we look at it in one sense, that when we have a taste for hearing, the Lord cleanses the heart. But at the same time, we have to have a cleaner heart to hear attentively. What in the beginning means that we, we hear from a pure devotee of the Lord. We may not be completely cleansed of material desire, the desire, it says here, for material enjoyment. But at least we're not engaged in activities, sinful activities. We're not engaged in accumulating more and more material anartas. But the tendency is still, or the desire is still there in the moment. But by rendering service to the pure devotees of the Lord, avoiding those activities, the taste for hearing and chanting the holy name, Srimad Bhagavatam grows. And as that grows more and more, then the Lord in the heart cleanses the desire for material enjoyment, not just engaging in material enjoyment or something like that, but actually the desire itself is removed from the heart of the body when we develop an urge to hear his messages because they are virtuous when properly heard and chanted. So offenseless hearing and glor glorification of the Lord. Uh, this is the secret to be to hear without offense, to hear with submission, to hear with, to, with, um, with anxious determination, with enthusiasm, and without ill motivation, uh, any other desire to obtain something, just simply to inquire submissively um, from the pure devotees of the Lord. So the quality of our hearing is also very essential in order so that that reciprocation, that relationship with Krishna can be developed. Even in ordinary dealings in this world, when we're attentive to somebody or we're very respectful to somebody, then the reciprocation is much more congenial, it's much more um, effective. We will go, let's see, we'll read just one or two more things, not much more, and then we'll open for questions. Let's see where we go now. Um, we're going to the second canto, previous chapter to the one you just um, are reading at the moment, in fact. 
Yeah. This is text number eight of the second canto, chapter number eight, text number eight, 288. I'm only going to read the purport a little bit. The verse is a direct question, which is related actually to today's verse, uh, the gigantic body of the Supreme Lord. And how does the creation come from that great body of the Lord? But in the purport, Prabhupada writes, one should note how Mar Maharaj Pariksha intelligently put questions before his spiritual master for scientific understanding of the transcendental body of the Lord. And it goes on to explain that gigantic body, like, like it has been described in many places before this, that the Lord assumed a gigantic body like that of Karana Dakshai Vishnu, from whose hair holes innumerable universes have generated. The body of Garba Dakshai Vishnu is described as sprouting the lotus stem within which all the planets of the universe remain. And at the top of the stem is the lotus flower on which Lord Brahma is born. In the creation of material world, the Supreme Lord undoubtedly assumes a gigantic body. And living entities also get their bodies, big or small. If the Lord didn't have a body, we would not have one either, according to necessity. For example, an elephant gets a gigantic body, and an ant gets a body according to its needs. Similarly, the personality of God assumes a gigantic body to accommodate the universes or the planets of a particular universe. There is no difference in the principle of assuming or accepting a particular type of body in terms of necessity. Anyway, just, just a little bit on the subject matter which today's verse was describing. Um, so, I think we'll probably finish there for now. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. After all, the subject matter is all about questions and answers. Hare right, Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, we thank you for uh, being here in the first place. Uh, I would like to apologize to the assembled devotees, and also apologize to you directly, uh, Maharaj, for not attempting to have your association earlier than we did today. This is why you didn't. <laughs> no, Maharaj. Uh, when, when a couple of devotees saw uh, our flyer that you would be speaking today, uh, a couple of people called me and congratulated Hare Krishna Africa to being able to have you come to speak to us. And these devotees, even though they are different individuals, they probably do not know each other, but uh, they told me, oh, Zadev, you guys are so fortunate to have Maharaj. Yeah. And and the description was like... Let's get on with it, Sahadev. Dave. Any yeah. Well, Maharaj, okay, I understand. Uh, I, I did not mean to embarrass you, but I just wanted to express our appreciation uh, to having your association and uh, speaking Krishna Katha to us. You know... And, sorry. The word is, if anyone may have questions, comments, realizations... Uh, please may indicate by using the hand emoji, uh, your physical hand, and you'll be asked to unmute to speak. A comment here. Uh, when the body has said, Lord Krishna's name is there 17 times in that purport. Oh. Purport. So yeah. we all hear, you know, there's questions related to Krishna. So Dr. Yeah. Siddhartha Maharaj would often judge an article by how many times Krishna's name was mentioned mm. related to Krishna. He yeah. would never take credit or say if Krishna so desires, it wouldn't be we will do if Krishna so desires. The art of Krishna Bhagavatam is to try to help us to see Krishna in the center of everything. 
And this is the real secret. When we put Krishna in the center of our lives, everything becomes adjusted. When we put ourselves in the center of life, everything becomes chaotic. Simple process of transformation. So Bhagavatam particularly takes off where the Bhagavad Gita leaves off. It takes off where Bhagavatam leaves off to help us to go further and living our lives with Krishna in the center of our lives. And all the questions should be geared in that direction. How to put Krishna more in the center of our lives, not just how I can solve. These things are there in material dealings, how I can solve my family problems, my health problems, my economic problems, and so on. But they should also be seen so that I can serve Krishna better or so that I can remember Krishna more or whatever, render better service to Krishna or something. should always be in relationship with Krishna, not this independent mentality. This is devotional service is constant. Questions about Krishna should always be there. I'm sure in the beginning we all ask questions about Krishna consciousness movement. We are eager to find out that eagerness should always be there to move forward. Not that now I've got the answers and I stop. We all have opportunity to advance in Krishna consciousness. So there's another question has come up here um, on the meeting chat. How can one come to the level of pure surrender? Is that come by becoming attentive? How can we do if we are not able to be attentive? Well, as we mentioned in that two verses, Shri Shri Shro, Shri Ladana, Sriam, Srinvatam, Sakata, Krishna, how it seems like, which, is it the chicken first or the egg first? So in this case, um, we mentioned that we have the good fortune of associating with devotees. And that's how the real cycle of devotional service begins. It doesn't start in of itself, but even with a gyata creature, that's also unknowing good fortune. You got unknowing the good fortune of somehow or another coming in contact with devotional service mm, presented by a devotee of the Lord one way or another. Uh, and by that contact, there is some benefit, some purifications there. And that will lead, the result of some contact with the devotee leads to the opportunity for more contact. And if there is any degree of favorability or good fortune in the heart, then that gradually builds up. It's like a bank account that ever increases. So gradually, gradually, one's faith, one's for Bhakti and Mukha Sukriti, one's piety due to connection with Bhakti or devotional service gradually grows to such an extent that one then develops an inclination to, to associate, which, of course, everyone online has at this moment of time for sure, to associate with devotees in one form or another. And then in the association of devotees, inevitably, one hears, whether you like it or lump it, one hears. We may reject what we hear, or we may accept what we hear, or we may accept something and reject something. Whatever we accept, if we reject what we hear, then more purification is required so that we may become more and more inclined or eligible to develop or If we are a little bit interested in anything we hear, we may apply it in our lives. And as we apply it in our lives, then the purification of service takes place. And as our heart becomes purified, then the inclination to hear more develops. And on and on it goes like that. The heart becomes cleansed by as the hearing process starts to grow. And that's what sadhana is for, to help us to develop this inclination to hear and chant about Krishna. So the surrendering process goes along with that growth of faith. There's, they're synonymous almost with each other. As our faith in Krishna or hearing and chanting about Krishna grows, this is our service. This is synonymous with surrender. They go along. It's not one before the other. They go along simultaneously at this point of time. Um, so like that. So it's a, just to associate with devotees is a degree of surrender. To hear from devotees is a degree of surrender. To apply what we hear as the verse today, the initial verse today said, proper utilization of what we hear. If we utilize what we hear, it's a sign of surrender. It may not be complete surrender, but it is a stage of surrender. As they surrender unto me, I reciprocate or reward accordingly. So Krishna rewards like this. He takes away the material attachments 
and a natural uh, the awakening in our heart, the natural awakening of attraction to Krishna develops. So this is the reciprocation with the Lord. He takes away the barriers so we can see things clear, more clearly. And then whether we call it surrender or progress, our development of faith goes on and on and on like this. It depends on us so how we as who we so how we associate how we associate with devotees, with the Srimad Bhagavatam, with the holy name. Um, and it just takes time to grow. We may not be completely surrendered, so we may be a little inattentive. But in the association of devotees, then this is possible. It will gradually, gradually evolve. If we are careful, though, be very careful not to commit offenses in the association of devotees. That will either hold up our progress or even cover our progress for some period of time at least. We want to make steady progress, associate with devotees by hearing and serving in their presence, and try and please not to commit offenses in the association of devotees and inquire how we can advance in Krishna consciousness, how we can develop a more surrendered attitude, how we can hear more attentively. These are signs of anxiousness, desire to inquire from the bona fide spiritual master or from the pure devotees. The same when we read Bhagavatam, it should be in that mood of submission. Um, so, what more? I, Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj. I think we we had uh, His Grace Shuman Varaha Prabhu's hand up. Uh, Prabhuji, you still there? Uh, you may unmute. You go ahead to speak, please. Jai. Uh, please accept my humble obeisance, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to all the assembled devotees. Thank you very much uh, for the enlightening discussion. <clears throat> I have one question, which is uh, that Krishna Consciousness Movement is considered to be the mercy movement of Lord Chaitanya. Who is giving uh, to every conditioned soul, whether qualified or unqualified, uh, the opportunity to to develop love of God? So our Vedic text talks about qualifications in different ways at different times. But Lachintanya particularly, consider everyone unqualified. And his movement is supposed to be a mercy movement. So I often wonder if uh, uh, unknowingly we are not, uh, if unknowingly, maybe unknowingly in our preaching, uh, we don't make people feel that uh, they are actually not qualified for Krishna consciousness. Or rather, we should be uh, pushing Lord Chantanya's movement of mercy and uh, giving everyone opportunity to qualify or qualify. This is always uh, going on in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my yeah, this is You hear? Thank you so much, Paul. We do hear the Madhi Madhi Kari, of course, he does. Well, they do um, discriminate um, between innocent, between the devotees, of course, the Supreme Lord, innocent, and the atheist or the non devotees. And we may not be so expert at discriminating. But in Lord Chaitanya's movement, as you say, he said qualified or unqualified, and other times he's even Lord Chaitanya, the spiritual master, said you are not qualified. You simply chant the holy names. So we have an initial situation, which maybe in different countries and parts of the world it's different, but the general principle is that we make Krishna consciousness opportunity available to everyone. Krishna's in the heart, of course, guiding the living entities. Not everyone necessarily comes in contact, but, but um, the devotees go out on Sankirtan, they do public programs. We do mass prasad distribution, mass book distribution, Rathiatra festivals. Temples are open to all. 
you know, we don't, in one sense, there's maybe certain regulated discrepancies, but generally speaking, especially with public preaching, there's no initial discrimination involved. One makes it available to all. Now, if somebody comes taking that opportunity, which is afforded them of that open invitation, and then at that stage, there may be some apparent degree of discrimination. In other words, if someone comes very challenging or very atheistic, then one's approach will be different to someone who comes very submissively. One is not necessarily obligated to, um, say, reciprocate with somebody who's completely atheistic or challenging. Um, we may have to, to a certain extent, but not to the same extent we really would with someone who's submissive. So the initial thing is like a sifting process where everyone is given the opportunity. And then you can see who is willing and who's not willing, or who, who is, you know, could say, atheistic or who is somewhat innocent um, at that stage. So, and the same thing with living in, let's say, get, taking a stage further, although the temples are open to everyone, not everyone's, let's say, suitable to live in a temple. There are standards, there are degrees of, of um, surrender required to live in a temple, or at least the degree of willingness to surrender to the standard of living in a temple. Um, and there may be seemingly some discrimination, but the initial or the opportunity for everyone is given to everyone, depending on the Lord, um, guiding the living entities accordingly. But the devotee doesn't, when we go on Hari Nam, we don't, you know, we don't kind of like, hey, be quiet, there's an atheist passing by. We may sometimes be quiet when we pass by a mosque out of respect, or even a church maybe, but we certainly don't discriminate because of, you know, qualification exactly as out of some other reasons. It's a general free for all. Pasadam is made available to all um, within the law. Um, and But then after that, there may be some. That's my, I would say, one perspective, as my heart tells me, um, in that regards. In the beginning, everyone is welcome. It's like education. Everyone is entitled to get educated, but some, some individuals don't want to take the education, and therefore they may drop out or they may be put into a, another stream of education. It's not because of the education system per se, it's because of our particular um, inclination, our particular relationship with it. So living entities have no interest in Krishna consciousness. Automatically then there is a, you know, we're not gonna spend your time on them unnecessarily. The tendency is to get captivated, especially when we're preaching oftentimes persons of enthusiastic religious fever fervor um, like to spend their time trying to convince the devotees. Well, if you want to do that, that's your choice. But generally, a devotee doesn't waste their time with that um, because, you know, generally there's no real change takes place. Um, that's one example. Although initially, of course, those persons see us, they come up and, uh, you know, they may question or query or and challenge whatever it is. And some discrimination is there. It has to be usable common sense. Has to be some kind of um, uh, restriction or or, or um, limitation there um, because we have a duty to try to get, make it available to all. So you make the initial thing available to all, but the follow up is a little bit more careful in one's uh, say to whom one one. Mm. It's the same with the glories of the holy name. We don't reveal those to the faithless, but we chant the holy name to everyone faithless, faithful. Everyone, deaf, dumb, no matter who they are, They're sinful, pious, everyone gets the opportunity to hear the name. Everyone gets the opportunity to take prasadam. Everyone gets the opportunity to see Lord Jagannath. Everyone gets the opportunity to see a devotee. But the uh, then after that, there is a degree of of, uh, of um, discrimination, you could say. Not that we want to discriminate. It's like the moon doesn't discriminate. I don't want to shine for this person. It's up to the individual whether they take advantage of the moon's shine or not. The moon shines for everyone, whether they're demons or devotees or whatever, theist, atheist. The moon shines for everybody. But it's up to us whether we want to take advantage of it or not. It's up to the other person. And if they don't really want to take advantage of Krishna consciousness, the devotee doesn't. 
give them any more at that particular stage, of, generally speaking. Is that okay? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Shriman Prabhu, for your question. And thank you so much, Maharaj, for the beautiful answer. Uh, there is a question in the chat room, but Maharaj, uh, I have a question uh, which is a continuation of this same uh, topic or theme of qualification. So uh, I'm, I, will, I will read the question in the chat room after my question. Uh, Maharaj, that is, uh, the, the great devotees, when they heard that Maharaj Parikshit had been cursed uh, to die from a snake bite in seven days, they told him uh, the best thing to do is to hear Krishna Katha. And they, they found Shukadev Goswami, whom they said he was qualified. The great sages of Namesharanya, when they also saw uh, Sutta Goswami, they addressed him as being qualified. And so oftentimes we hear from devotees that someone has to be qualified to speak Bhagavatam. And sometimes devotees say that one should be a pure devotee before he can speak Srimad Bhagavatam. But somebody like myself, I am nobody in anything. But I also like to hear and sometimes like to speak Bhagavatam. And therefore, I understand that in that sense, I'm not qualified. But my question to you, Maharaj, is when we talk of someone being qualified to speak Srimad Bhagavatam, what do we actually mean and what are we looking for before somebody speaks Srimad Bhagavatam? Yeah. A very, I wish I could find it. I was going to read something, but I don't think I can find it now. Um, yeah, I don't know. But as you say, we hear this, there are several purports where Sri Prabhupada and many other places, of course, explain the qualification to be a speaker, a real speaker of Sri Bhagavatam. Now they have to be a realized soul, complete without any material desire, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as you quite rightly said, Saturday Prabhu, I, I agree with you. I agree. I'm, I'm also not even probably on the level of the dust of most of the devotees. Um, I have no qualification whatsoever. So what, what are we doing here? We're trying to hear from a pure devotee. Okay. I hope we have some eligibility for that, to hear from Srila Prabhupada, whom we accept as being a pure representative of Sukadeva Goswami, of Sutta Goswami, of our Parampara. We, we hear from other great followers of Srila Prabhupada, who we can see from their life, have dedicated themselves to Srila Prabhupada and his mission. One who's dedicated themselves to the mission of Srila Prabhupada is acting as a representative of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada has asked us to speak according, repeating his words in our, with our, in whatever realizations we may have, repeating his words or his statements to some degree in our own words, maybe not as perfect as it could be, maybe we are a little bit selfish motivated, but with a sincere desire is to try to push on the mission of the pure devotee of the Lord, to speak the words which he has showered on this world, to repeat those words. So reading, if we hear attentively, if we hear, not that we just speak whatever comes to our mind, but we have to hear from the Srimad Bhagavatam regularly. When Prabhupada took initiation from his spiritual master in 1933, that was the comment his spiritual master made, that this young man, hears nicely, therefore he will be qualified to speak. So the process in devotion service is like that. That's why we always have to read Srila Prabhupada's book regularly and hear from other devotees who are regularly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam or hearing Prabhupada's words. This way we become more and more eligible. I remember the first time 
when I joined the temple back in the early 70s, after about four weeks, they asked me to give class. It was in Bury Place in London. It wasn't a Bhagavatam class, it was an Isopanishad class. But naturally, you can imagine how one would feel. And I mean, there was, there was a sannyasi sat there, a temple president sat there, and I had to give a class on Isopanishad. Um, but, you know, if we surrender, it's our duty. Prabhupada asked us to do it. We may feel qualified or unqualified. We may not be qualified for anything. We're not qualified to do deity worship. We do it on behalf of Sri Prabhupada or our gurus. We may not be qualified to manage a temple, but you still do it. Uh, you may not be qualified. What are we qualified for? We have no qualifications, practically speaking. We simply take shelter of the pure devotee, pray for their mercy, follow their instructions. So if they tell us to do it, we have to do it. We have to do what we have to do. Our duty is there. But by uh, working under the order of the spiritual master, under the order of the pure devotees, everything becomes possible. The Lord in the heart makes everything possible because we're surrendering to his dear devotee. We're his representative. Krishna is very pleased when you act um, in accordance with the instruction of his pure devotees. So you're wanting to hear Krishna Kata and you will sometimes desire to speak Krishna Kata is in accord with the order of Sri Prabhupada. It's in accord with the order of our Parampara. We have to follow that order. You have to give whatever you've heard this is the secret of devotional service. Don't be a miser. Share whatever you hear. Don't speculate, but share whatever you hear from the pure devotees through the media of Shastra, through the media of Sadhu, etc. Just share it. Although we may not be able to probably give an example of a postman. He's simply passing on the message. He said we're peons. We just he said, My success, with my success is I'm not changing anything. I'm simply repeating the words of my spiritual master according to time, place, and circumstance. So that's the order we have to give. We have, that's a higher principle. We have to follow the order. Lord Chaitanya said, As you have heard from Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, you become a guru. You teach everyone in your land about the science of Krishna consciousness. At least we can chant the holy name if we don't have any other understanding or anything else to offer. Share the chanting of the holy name with others. Engage others in chanting or at least give prasadam, something. We have to share what we've got, what we've received, even if we have no qualification. If we act according to the direction of the pure devotee, you, become, you are empowered, you are qualified. A soldier acts under the direction of the general under the direction of the government. He doesn't know what to do. He just acts according to their direction. So I have no doubt that the since if it's sincere, we may not be pure in that sense. Our intent may be a little mixed. But if we really sincerely want to become a representative, we'll be praying for pure motivation, to become a pure, transparent media for the subjects of Krishna consciousness disseminated. Hare Krishna. All right, Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj, for the beautiful answer to my question. So uh, if we may take the first question in the chat room. Uh, Maharaj, there is a question in the chat room for Sari Krishna, dear Maharaj. My business is all gladys to Shri Prabhupada. Uh, how can we come to the level of pure surrender? We, we discussed that already. That was the first one we mentioned. Um, to some degree, pure certain how we can come to the degree. Yeah, we discussed that in the beginning of the questions and answers. Um, I, I read out the question earlier, but uh, if you want to follow on a little bit more, is it that the question is, is that uh, does that come by becoming attentive? And if that is the case, how can we do it if we are not able to be attentive? Yeah, but I answered that already. That question was already. I read the question earlier, answered it. Okay. So we didn't answer it very well. So we may go to the next question then. It says, yeah. if, if another devotee is suffering because of a loved one passing away, what can we share? Uh, perhaps a particular verse uh, from Krishna consciousness uh, is likely to console them. So, of course, if if there is a bit generic, so what works 
for some may not work for others. But what do you say, uh, Gurudev, when someone is suffering from a loved one passing away? What is that And particularly a non non devotee. Yeah, non devotee. Non devotee. With a devotee, of course, it's a little more you would expect. I mean, we even see amongst devotees, it's natural. Arjuna also, when his son Abhimanyu was killed in the Battle of Kurukshetra, became somewhat, you could say, overwhelmed with emotion. Um, and Prabhupada describes therein that after a while, this is, um, you know, devotee comes back. You could say to a, a more intelligent or a more Krishna conscious perspective on the situation, um, what, what good does lamentation bring? What good does anger or revenge or anything like this has no value or no remorse? It doesn't do any good for the departed soul, what to speak of those who are still alive. But it is not an unusual response, especially when it's a family member, um, to respond in a way which is a little bit emotional, maybe not so purely Krishna conscious. No, it's nothing unusual. Um, but the devotee will, quite, will normally easier to come around, depending on the degree of the attachment. We know that sometimes it's very difficult. It takes time. Everything takes time. Well, a non-devotee, as you say, there's something um, here, was it? non -devotee. You mentioned the word genetic, I think, was it? It's a loved one. The body is suffering because of a loved one. In other words, somebody in your, a non-devotee is not suffering because their loved one has passed away. And we're not talking of ours, we're talking of theirs. What can we share, perhaps a particular verse from Krishna consciousness, so it's likely to console them. This is a bit generic, so what works for some? Yeah, it's a fact. I mean, every situation is different. They may have strong religious beliefs. They may be totally atheistic or agnostic. <laughs> they may have you know, dislike, in fact, for anything spiritual. So a little bit of variation will be there in, in each particular case. But if it's something Krishna consciousness that we were told to share, what would we share? Well, again, you know, this is something we'd normally probably have to know it's in individual cases and make a little bit of preparation therein in order to address. But something whereby, you know, I mean, we see, for instance, in the case of Chitra Ketu, when his son passed away um, and how distressed he was about the passing of the child um, and how Narada Muni and uh, Angira Muni tried to console him. Well, it didn't have an awful lot of success either, to be honest. It was only when they used their mystic powers and brought the child back to life. Well, the best thing would be, you could say in that regard, they would probably surrender to Krishna entirely if you could bring the child back to life. But that's not likely to happen. Uh, especially if the child starts preaching to the parents, you know, who are you, <laughs> uh, etc. But um, what can you say to such a person who's lost it, one who's dear to them, be it a family member or a close friend, even a dog sometimes, people lament when they lose their dogs or whatever it may be. You can try to gently explain the, the eternality of the soul. You can gently explain, you know, um, you know, well, I don't know what else you can really explain. Maybe somebody else would like to add to that who has had practical experience of trying to console somebody in that particular situation. Srila Prabhupada, what did he say? Um, offhand, I can't remember him saying anything more than that. Um, uh, yeah. Prayer, I mean, in Christianity, of course, they use a lot of personal comfort, um, prayer, um, and so on. Mostly external comfort, of course, and praying for their welfare and so on to give them strength. Um, maybe somebody else would like to add something to the chat or like to say something on that one. It's a practical question. It does come up, and especially for those in, you know, social life and grihasta life and general life you have to often friends work friends or family friends 
persons you're acquainted with have this experience. We all have this experience, but hopefully we're a little bit more Krishna conscious when we're faced with it. The people in general, we cannot expect them to be in that mood. Some maybe, but not many. Maybe someone would like to share something there, what you experienced, how, you can, how we can help people in that situation, whether there's any particular verse. I mean, there would be, but we'd have to kind of think about it more and look a little bit more deeper into it. It's a subject someone could investigate, make available maybe to others. If it's not already available, maybe it is. I don't know. But it would be nice and something nice to have to um, offer to others something which may encourage them to be a little more Krishna conscious. Course, we can offer them prasadam, we can, we can offer them various things if they're willing to accept it. But as far as speaking or verses, preaching, sometimes people are beyond that. Their lamentation is like a dark cloud that you can hardly penetrate. And you just have to try to give something which will unknown, imperceptibly be beneficial. Um, anyone like to add something there and look after them? Yeah, that's the practical one, of course. If you try to care for them or give them some some um, help in that regards. Of course, how far you can go there, that depends on the situation, um, how much you can literally help. That's, I mean, there's different types of help. There's physical help, mental help, and spiritual help. So whatever you can offer there. Anything else? It helps to be next to them. Give them Vishadam. Yeah, that's the same like the Christian approach. You give them your time, you show them your love and compassion on the physical platform by being there. And in the case of a devotee, you try to maybe give them Prashadam. They may not be ready for hearing anything, but at least show your kindness. And, uh, you know, Sometimes philosophy doesn't go down very well in those situations. They can't digest it. Anything else? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Shri uh, Maharaj, Prabhu, please hear me on mute. And if we can, take them to the temple with us on Sunday program. Well, that's a nice idea. That usually comes a bit later. They've got to be in an over state of mind. Uh, you can go with them somewhere and maybe read something very sweet and pleasing, depending again on what level they're on. Some mm. nice analogies, some nice stories. Even Papa would sometimes tell some humorous uh, anal an allegorical analog an an analogies and so on. You make them laugh, make them feel a little bit up up uplifted with a twist of Krishna consciousness in there. Different things. Um, I mean, yeah, every situation is different. Maybe you have experienced yourself going through it and what helped you. You may be able to share that with them um, and so on and so forth. It's, Krishna will inspire you from within your heart if you turn to him. <clears throat> That's the, the only experience I've got <clears throat> when I've been in a situation like that is, to, is that somehow that usually Krishna inspires you from within your heart. There's no pat answer. It's like when you're book distributing books, it's not like you're not machines. Each person's, you know, it's a different reciprocation. It's not a machine. You're not just like robots. <laughs> it's a very personal interaction with that soul. Uh, okay, there was something else? Yes, uh, Shema Vara Prabhu, please, you may unmute now. Pardon? Uh, I was asking Shema Vara Prabhu to unmute. He has a send up. Oh. Yeah. Uh, like, it's like I, well, I'm driving, I was driving, but it's like I heard Maharaj saying if anyone has something to share yeah. uh, on what to do on that occasion. So, well, I just, uh, I noticed that, and we all know this, that non devotees actually do not have much knowledge about the soul. Many do not, or they think they know, but many do not have the type of information we have about the soul. Uh, from experience, once <clears throat> there is a, a new devotee who had, the, for the first time, he had the, the verse, so Bhagavad Gita, chapter, chapter 2, text 24. Ashidu yam adayo yam akledyo susya evacha nitya sarvagata stanu ashalo yam sanantana. 
<clears throat> that verse that the soul is unbreakable, insoluble, and can be neither burnt nor dried. It's everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. So when this person had this, this verse, uh, in fact, she moved me to be able to also feel more inspired about that verse because she was saying, no, this is incredible. Tell me again that the soul never dies, cannot be burnt, cannot be broken, nothing. And then she, she just felt, now I am happy for, I'm, I will always be happy because now I've had something I've never had before. Now, yes. she, she, she used to be a Muslim. And then uh, she said, this, this one particular knowledge that soul cannot be broken, dry, or burnt, not to talk of dying, that really made it for her. So I feel that the more we speak about the qualities of the soul to non-devotees, the more they will wake up from their you know, grief anytime they are having problems like this. Thank you, Maharaj Hare Krishna, for giving the opportunity. Very nice. Thank you, Prabhu. That's um, generally, of course, the section which we were talking, of course, with devotees particularly, or persons somewhat acquainted with spiritual life then. Prabhupada would always emphasize that we should speak on the, these verses in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. There's a whole series, as you probably know, of verses describing the difference between body and soul and the nature of the soul, to, at least to some degree there. That's very good. It's a wonderful experience. I think that's something which we can all learn from and uh, maybe apply also. And if there's any degree, you could say, of, of uh, interest or a little bit of belief in the soul, whatever, then that verse is definitely a, a great verse to quote. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sriman Varaha Prabhu. That was wonderful. Anything oh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Sriman Varaha Prabhu, and thank you so much, Maharaj. Of course, the question uh, relates to a non-devotee. But there was a time that uh, we were fortunate we had His Holiness Giriraj Swami Maharaj speak on this platform. Mm. One devotee asked a similar question, but this time it was uh, pertaining to a devotee that one devotee had suddenly lost her little daughter and the person speaking at the time was saying this devotee was, even though young, I think like nine or 10 years old, but she was very energetic, preaching and distributing flyers when they had an outdoor program. And suddenly she passed away. So she was asking Maharaj what the devotees needed to do with the uh, mother of the deceased uh, young girl. And Maharaj's response was, go there, just like I think Madhu, Madhu Mangal Prabhu was saying, give, give her your love, give her time. But Maharaj won't, do not preach philosophy. <laughs> and so, uh, and I, I, I don't know if Maharaj, you want to share something. I was thinking that, Maharaj, His Holiness Kiraj Maharaj said, do not preach philosophy because this is a devotee who already knows the nature of the, uh, the soul. Like his great Shema Varaha uh, referenced from the Bhagavad Gita, the devotee obviously knows that. And yet due to human nature, she was lamenting. And therefore Maharaj said, do not preach to uh, this lady. So I don't know if, Maharaj, you have something to say in this regard. One, uh, if it's a non-devotee, sometimes quoting something from the back of the Gita, like Shema Vara Prabhu just referenced to, might help solace, give some solace to the grieving person. But in other times, when the person, the grieving person is already in knowledge, here Maharaj is saying that, it's better to stay away from preaching. 
philosophy to this person at this particular time. Interesting, huh? <laughs> it's kind of almost the opposite, you think. Very interesting. Every says what it says, it's somewhat different. Each person's a different situation. Um, preaching philosophy, well, that again, when we, as I mentioned earlier, even Angira Muni and Narada Muni preached to Chittaketu when he lost his son. Um, but it didn't really wake him up. He, he could, I understand, it didn't remove his lamentation, put it like that. Um, and it's, as you say, I know all this, why are you telling me this now? You know, it's, that's not necessarily what, everyone's different. Some devotees, it's different. Everyone's different. We're at different levels. We have to go through different, different purifications and so on and so forth. But what do you do in that situation? And as you say, Giri Rajma said, don't, don't preach philosophy. Just give your time, your love, your endeavor to try to console them by serving them and so on and so forth, which naturally um, you can say is appreciated, no matter whether devotee or non-devotee. That's obviously appreciated. I'm going to do that which helps in preaching. It's, like, it's again the same thing as in today's verse, you know, how to properly utilize this knowledge, how to utilize this opportunity uh, in a way which has its effect. So if, you're, if your purpose is to try to bring that person back to Krishna consciousness way of seeing things, you have to see what is the best way to do that. You don't have a pat answer. It depends on every individual case. You may it may be that you know you just sit there sometimes, you just read, you and I know other occasions we we just do us just simply chant or read or just pray. So every situation is has its uniqueness about it. Um, but definitely we don't just go there just to preach as if you know, that's going to be the, the one at one off answer to everything. It's a different type of preaching. Preaching is not just speaking words. Preaching is by actions. Preaching is by feelings. Preaching is by even desires, by intent, everything. So if your sincere intent is there to genuinely, let's say, genuinely serve that devotee, to help that devotee, um, and surely Krishna will give you the intelligence what to do. You know, I, don't know, I don't know if you can say every situation is exact. We don't go with intent. Now I'm going to go and preach to them. But sometimes you'll find that that, that also is is something they want to hear, to be reminded of. But it varies. And maybe after some time that becomes the case. I usually find in the very beginning that's not the case, but maybe after a little while, then, you know, you kind of settle down a little bit. The initial shock, the initial emotional desire. Distress becomes a little bit, the dust settles down a little bit, and then we can start seeing things in more of a Krishna conscious perspective. Time, place, and circumstance. It is better to test it first, as you say, as Marat said. Don't go in there and preachy, preachy, and thinking that will solve it. Go in and just give your time to them, console them, and just see. Maybe that's, you can understand. What is the next step in medicine? Medicine is also like that. You don't just go and give the same thing. You have to see the condition of the patient before you give the necessary prescription, the necessary medicine. Even if you know the medicine, they may still, you may have to wait until their condition is favorable to receive it. So it's nice, interesting. Huh? Different ways of, everything's different. Every individual is different. There's not a black and white situation. Anything else? Uh, does anyone have something to share or ask? Uh, it's very interesting, my right? The analogies you you gave in this regard, especially with the medication, is is something I think everybody can relate to. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone with something to share or ask? Others, I would like to uh, share with you, assembled of witnesses, uh, a little bit about uh, Maharaj. Uh, it's a very brief bio I'm going to... Uh, it might be a bit outdated there, Sahadev. They've been reading, if it's something you're reading, it's the same thing they've been reading for the last 20 years, and it's changed a bit since then. 
Ah, uh, okay. Well, I would just say briefly that uh, Maharaj is a direct disciple of Jagat Guru Param Guru Shri Prabhupada. Uh, he's been with the movement, like Maharaj was saying, in the early 70s, like 72, thereabout. And uh, like Maharaj is saying, things have changed. But what I have now is that Maharaj uh, is very much well known for book distribution and the kirtan and preaching. So Maharaj, uh, somebody had indicated in the chat room, which I didn't see early enough, but there was a suggestion that if we may uh, permit you or allow you to chant, we did not see that on time and you had already started speaking. So if by Guru Krishna's grace, by your grace, we are fortunate to have your association again and next time, Maharaj, you may choose to uh, sing. Uh, that would be a very uh, blessing to, to hear you sing. Uh, but Maharaj loves to sing, uh, chant the holy names of the Lord, and he's also a book distributor. Uh, Maharaj, I'm not sure if you are still in charge of the prayer uh, temple. Uh, I understand is the only Krishna Balaram installed deities outside of India that we have around the world. And Maharaj, the only ones installed by Prabhupada Srila Prabhupada. It's not installed by Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for the correction. I uh, thank you, Maharaj. Um, deities so, in Istan, in different parts of the world, but yeah. directly installed by Prabhupada, only in Vrindavan and New Mayapur in France. New Mayapur, yes. As we all know, none of us are in charge, of course, but we have responsibilities. So I'm trying to serve a little bit here in France, the devotees. And although we have no qualification, we're trying to do a little service here on behalf of your Prabhupada. The same thing. We don't, I'm not a book distributor as per se in terms of, of the, with the right attitude or even with the right ability, but I try to support those who are doing book distribution and try to encourage encourage the distribution of Prabhupada's books. This is our one of our only hopes. We our, we have no eligibility. I I remember one time in Vrindavan I had this I guess been instrumental in giving a class there and and after the class, you know, it was three not a piece in the chains on Gopanim. And uh Aindra Prabhu came up after the class and uh, we're talking he was talking about our only eligibility is this, that we have no other, no eligibility. The only hope we have is to take shelter of the holy name. That's the only eligibility we have. We're not really eligible to do anything else. We relatively may have some small capacity, but that in of itself is not the real eligibility. It's when we take shelter of the holy name of Krishna, all of the various activities which we do, Bhakti Siddhanta Ramana said, are judged by the degree it helps us to develop our faith and our attachment to chanting the holy name of Krishna. It's our only hope. Kirtan is our only hope, you could say, chanting the holy name. So we try to, you know, whatever. I don't say like or not like. Um, there's some degree nothing compared to most but some degree in all of us i'm sure much more in your case of some kind of desire i mean i can hear kirtan going on downstairs now and the boys there are obviously in sincere or serious about chanting they're doing it the more we can chant the more the faith will grow the more you know the hope there is for us otherwise we have very little hope accompanied by Prabhupada's desire to see this knowledge is disseminated with the hope that some qualified persons will take it up by receiving this knowledge through the media of Sri Prabhupada's association. We have, Prabhupada said, our two minutes, what is the use of that? If we give them a book, then they can hear from the pure devotees of the Lord. So if you don't, someone else, we read from Prabhupada's books or speak from them, distribute those books to others, and surely by the grace of Krishna, many persons, sincere, qualified persons, will take up Krishna consciousness. And I said, even if you all leave, this movement will carry on because these books are here. The book distribution is so important to um, disseminate 
Krishna consciousness, make it available to all living entities. It doesn't matter whether we're, you know, even if you just give a book away once, one book a day or one book a week or one book a year, but just some or another try to see how we can distribute these books of Srila Prabhupada, distribute the holy name of Prashadam everywhere. What more can we do? We may not have the purity to help bring people much further along the line, but Krishna will help them. He'll help the devotees. If you're sincere, Krishna will give that association. Try to become that association, but you can't be what we're not. We pray we can become a little bit more Krishna conscious, depend upon the mercy of the Vaishnavas. So with a humble heart, try to chant the holy name, try to render some service to devotees, and pray that we can become sincere representatives of Srila Prabhupada. It's mission. Shri Prabhupada's mission. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, before we wrap up today's uh, Krishna Katha, uh, Maharaj, we have one humble plea and one uh, sincere request. The humble plea is that uh, Maharaj, we humbly uh, uh, would like to have your association once again, uh, very soon, and if by Guru Krishna's grace we are able to send you an invitation, we, we pray at your lotus feet that, if possible, of course, uh, you accept our invitation and you come uh, be with us, give us your wisdom and love and blessings again. And our because it's very humbling and you know we all need humbling there's no degree no degree of how humble we what is the depth of humility your humility is very inspiring thank you Hare Krishna Maharaj. and our uh, sincere request is that as we're trying to serve Krishna as revealed by Sri Prabhupada uh, we're going to be tested and tempted in so many ways. Uh, but we beseech thee that you pray to Shri Prabhupada and bless us in such a way that if even we cannot do as expected, but at least we do not leave Shri Prabhupada's house, we remain Shri Prabhupada's uh, devotees and hopefully at some point will become loyal and become expected children of Sri Prabhupada. This is our request. Uh, sincere uh, prayer. Uh, that yes. day we can all pray for each other. We all need that. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. Will. Thank you, we also need your prayers. We're all fallible. We're all what can we say? Without the mercy of the Vaishnavas, we are nothing. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. On behalf of all the devotees, uh, dear devotees, we're going to humbly request you all to kindly unmute. And together, we all chant the loudest Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to express our appreciation to have in His Holiness Jananda Goswami Maharaj speak to us today, please, so you may all unmute. Jai. Hare Krishna. 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 India, Australia, South America, wherever it is, Asia, wherever it is, we offer our obeisances and thank you for your kind association. Apologies for right, Krishna consciousness and any offenses may be committed. Of of you were having to associate with me the last hour or so. Shira Prabhupada, almost two hours to be honest. Hare Krishna. Shira Prabhupada, Jai. Jai. 
Outlandistic Solinus and Nanago Semi Maharaji Kija, Jaya. Prabhupada Kija, Jaya. Samo the Vaishnava, Navidu with his Kija, Jaya. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.